Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll look at the state of charter schools in Arizona, and we'll hear about a singing competition that showcases beautiful voices and vocal health. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. A bus strike that could have affected tens of thousands of visitors using mass transit during the Super Bowl was avoided today. Mayor Greg Stanton announced this morning that an agreement was reached between union officials and First Transit, which runs over a dozen routes in the city. The new three-year deal improves worker wages and scheduling issues. The agreement was made after overnight talks and will now be voted on by union members. Mayor Stanton says that if a strike had occurred during the Super Bowl, transit services would have been provided by the city, but it would have been costly. Tonight's edition of Arizona Education looks at charter schools. Arizona is often considered a leader in the school choice movement, due in large part to state-funded charters. We'll hear from an education advocate along with one of the founders of the state's charter school movement in a moment. But first, producer Christina Estes and photographer Kyle Mouse visit Basis, one of the most successful brands in the charter movement. It's one of the first things you notice at Basis. There are no bells. No bells directing students to get to class. It helps the kids stay on time and manage their own time. They're responsible for tracking their passing periods. Principal Petra Poitas says holding students accountable is key to their success. They know how to have high expectations for themselves and for the teachers, and the teachers perform better because of that. Now we'll tell it. Uh, we're dissecting it to find some bones. Basis schools want to bridge what they call the international achievement gap. So the youngest students have two teachers. One is considered an expert in the subject area. The other is called a learning expert. And that learning expert teacher understands child psychology, understands how to teach high-level mathematics to a child. So you have these two teachers uh, in every classroom in grades one through four, and that leads to students being able to get information from subject experts. It's very uncommon in district schools, very uncommon in schools generally. At Basis Phoenix, where they serve fifth through 12th graders, the teachers cover more than one grade level. For our next ionic equation. And like many schools, Basis faces fiscal donate. challenges. Every year, parents are asked to donate to the teacher fund. 100% of the proceeds of the fundraising go back to teacher performance bonuses. So we want to recruit them, retain them, and reward them for their excellent work. Basis Ed CEO Peter Bazanson says parents also pay for extracurricular activities so they can put every public dollar directly into the classroom. I think a big part of where we're fiscally conservative is in our facilities. I mean, we have facilities that are on small parcels of land, um, and, uh, and much of our space within a facility is dedicated to classrooms. So we have very little in the way of what you might call non-revenue generating space. Uh, so we are uh, very conservative with our facility build out. Um, and so a typical district school will cost many times what we're able to build a school for at Basis. They're raptors and they can't digest the bones. Basis schools consistently rank high in national lists that focus on performance and standardized tests. But Bazanson says it's not because they only take the smart kids. But it is a popular misconception because our kids are so smart. Uh, parents think that you have to be smart to make it here, but we make you smart. While basis schools charge no tuition and offer open enrollment, not everyone gets in. They have more applicants than space and rely on a computerized lottery system to fill a limited number of seats. Basis currently operates 13 charter schools in the state with plans to open four more next year. Here now to discuss charter schools in general is former state superintendent of public instruction Lisa Graham Keegan, who helped draft legislation to create charter schools in Arizona. Also joining us, Arizona Education Association President Andrew Morrill. Good to see you both here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, before we get into... I, Oh, well, let's get into it anyway. Let's yeah. get into it right well, now. Well, <laughs> okay. We're ready. Uh, not that. I want... Let's... For, for, what is, give me a definition, what is a charter school? A charter school is a public school who's on contract with the state to increase achievement. 
So charter schools were brought into the public school system, Ted, in order to allow teachers to bring schools to the school marketplace that would elevate achievement in Arizona. So they'd be another option for parents. The difference between a charter school and a district school. A district school traditionally has been the school that you're assigned to. Now, that in Arizona, probably maybe less than 40% um, or 40% of kids, I should say, are choosing outside that assigned area. But in local districts, a district school was the neighborhood school. It's governed by the district. And in, back in the day, that just was assumed to be your school. Arizona has not done that for over 30 years, way before public charter schools came around. What do charter schools offer that's different from district schools? Well, they offer a choice, and Arizona is a choice-rich state. Uh, Lisa knows all about that. She, I, I, by the way, I've never been described as a founder of anything, so I'm, I'm very jealous. <laughs> I shall, next time I shall I'm, remediate that. You next time I'm on horizon, founder. I want to be described as the founder of something. Charter schools offer learning labs in best case scenarios. Um, actually, the Arizona Education Association was not only curious but supportive of the concept of any setting that would allow um, those best practices to materialize. Uh, some 20 years later, um, we have lots of questions, some answers. Um, the one, th one thing we know is that in a choice-rich state, while a lot of policy attention is directed at charter schools, Arizona's parents are still overwhelmingly choosing their neighborhood public schools, so we want to put that all in perspective. Why are they doing that? I think it's like 80 some odd percent. Why are they doing that? It's actually about 18 percent of public school students in Arizona are in public charter schools, so Andrew's right about that a bit. So you get, um, they choose the traditional school because that's what we're used to. I mean, remember, they've only been around for 20 years. So what we want is parents choosing excellent schools, Ted, and hopefully this bifurcation between district and charter really begins to sort of go away and we start to focus on who's an excellent school. So last year, Arizona charter schools, 73% of them either scored A or B grades or they improved a grade. In Arizona, if you're a charter school C or below, you're busy going out of business, we hope, because that wasn't the deal. And we have a lot of schools that did not make the grade. The Arizona State Board for Charter Schools is taking those schools out of business. But we don't just have basis, which is a fabulous system. We have a lot of high-performing public charter schools and district schools that serve very low-income kids. And that should be the bifurcation, excellence and everybody else. Describe a typical charter school. <laughs> well, a typical charter school is, uh, is innovative. It is a learning lab. But I, I'm going to take Lisa at her word. I don't know that it's necessarily the differences uh, so much in the design of instruction. I, I think that, um, you know, I, I'm going to pardon me a moment for the analogy, but I'm a diehard U of A Wildcat fan. And we know in this uh, area of the state that can present some political problems of its own. It's never about the students on the field when it comes down to the ASU U of A rivalry. It's about those incessant fans for the other side. Sometimes <laughs> I think it's like that with charter and district. We lose sight of what might be some of the common ground uh, where the policy enthusiasm is. I, I will take a charter school teacher devoted, wanting to do right by students and say that the mission of that individual teacher is largely the same as the mission of an individual district teacher. But the policy arena has complicated this. It has uh, bifurcated and, and really in a sort of a, a, a tactic better reserved for seafood created a kind of peel and eat mentality. Charter against district, district against charter, when in reality we have major funding issues and we have a quest going on both at the district and charter level for the best practices, opening doors to all students. That's the mission of our public schools. Same yeah. question. I'm not sure if you quite got the answer. I think give me a one sentence answer within that paragraph. You know, it's, I'm, I'm not going to play the what's different because there are a lot of similarities and a well, lot of differences. Yeah. No, my question was describe a typical charter There's school. One. There the is one. Nor is there a typical okay. district school, mm -hmm. Ted. I mean, this, this, it really depends on the leaders in that school. And this is really important for parents to understand. First of all, you should know the grade on your school, but that's just proxy for a lot of things right? You should be in an A or B school. If you're not, you ought to be asking some pretty serious questions. The whole state should be. A and B is not that difficult in Arizona. And then there's a whole host of other things. There is no typical school anymore. Can't, well, 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 okay, answer me this. Can charters pick and choose students? They may not. If they're doing it, it's illegal. So they have to take whoever comes. And you heard 
in the preview there on basis, they take a lottery system. So they're oversubscribed, they have waiting lists, they can't accept kids. I was just down at CE Rose in Tucson Unified School District, a fabulous, um, it's been an A school over the years, um, huge waiting list. They serve over 80% low income kids. Uh, they're a district school, they do not look like other district schools. Do, and parents want to get in there, go figure. So I, I and it doesn't look typical, trust me, they, they're doing some really innovative things. That's the leadership at the school, that's the teaching team at the school. Well, here's the, here's the truth. Um, over time, institutions develop good practices, sound practices, and poor practices. Mm -hmm. Is everybody operating above board? Uh, we'd like to think so. We hear reports all the time of a certain kind of class management, student body management. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that there aren't flaws in the district public education system. Some of the selectivity does seem to follow with the most celebrated charter schools. There are also examples, and, and I think uh, it is true, there is no one charter school prototype. Uh, there's no one district school prototype. There are questions that both systems raise. How are we going to educate? Well, every student in Arizona, and how are we going to make sure that the doors of a public school are open to everyone then? So do you, are, are you saying some charter schools do pick a little bit and choose a little bit more? I'm saying that in an institution with as many players, you hear stories again and again, patterns of behavior that would account for some of the student management in some. You got to be careful about generalizations because just about the time you point to one charter school student body, you find another made up completely of minority students with an operating mission to educate students better than maybe even their siblings were educated, same family, different outcome. We just have to be careful. I think the thing that's really important right now in Arizona, with an overwhelming choice by parents of one type, the district neighborhood public school, I'd rather ask why are so many policymakers acting as if that's somehow the wrong choice and doing everything they can to kind of steer people over to maybe their choices. So is this really about parent choice or is it about a choice informed by somebody's political agenda? Well, the growth though, Andrew, the growth is all on the side of public charter schools, all on the side. So they're only building public charter schools. You've got a couple of districts that are still building district schools. And so it's not a, it's not a static system. Uh, and uh, nor do I think we should be betting on one or the other. We ought to be making it equal. I know that's kind of boring if we sit here and agree a little bit, but, but I don't know that there's going to be that much disagreement anymore, Ted. If we focus on exceptional schools, on high quality schools, that should be what's governing policy. What's, what kind of liberties do you have to have to do that? What does the teaching staff look like to do that? What does hiring and firing practice look like to do that? Answer those questions and you probably come up with some sort of hybrid model ultimately. Well, are charter schools getting the results that you wanted, you expected to see when you helped start all this? A bunch of them are now, as I said. So you've got 73% now at A and B or increasing their grade. So yes, they're getting there. And I also think that kind of pressure is falling on the district side as well. You're seeing a lot of initiatives to raise uh, achievement. Once we went to an A through F grading system in Arizona, people paid a lot more attention. It's easier to understand. So no, I mean, my, my ideal system in my um, happy bubble head is we're all A quality schools, Ted. So until we're there, not yet. The questions I would say that still exist are, as a, not looking at any one charter school in particular, but across the industry of them in Arizona, what, how do we account for the fact that, for instance, Arizona has some of the highest percentages of free and reduced lunches in our public student population? Uh, some 45% of students are, are ELL. We have, we know, growing populations of, of high need students. Arizona's economy is actually producing students at the poverty level the way it used to produce cotton and citrus, unfortunately, and that's, that's sort of happened uh, one session, one, de one decision at a time. You don't find the student bodies of very many charter schools made up of the mix of students that make up the typical disagree. district students. So I we do disagree. have to ask questions Andrew, about that. No, it really is Go down across to South the Phoenix. industry. Go down now, to South Phoenix. I don't think we're agreeing NFL anymore, yet. by the way. Champion you'll, schools. you'll find individuals right but you Saber, won't Saber across Chavez the and industry. Roosevelt. When you add up the population of the students in the charter schools, you just don't get the same representation of the challenge students and needs, the ELL learners, uh, okay, some of the ethnic minority makeup. Let, 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 please. 
So we'll talk about this. So when we first started public charter schools, they were massively overrepresented by low income and um, ethnic minorities because those kids didn't have great choices. Now, I think Andrew's right at the margins in some areas, but it is absolutely not true in low income, high quality schools. They break 60% district, 40% charter. We have 100 schools in Arizona that serve a vast majority of low income kids. 60 of those a district, 40% charter. If you sit in a room and listen to these guys, you cannot tell the difference because they're focused on a practice that is excellent. Again, a gap of certain success stories, certain schools that are exactly as Lisa describes. Regrettably, the ones being celebrated uh, even by our current governor, and good luck to him, uh, during the campaign as most worth celebrating, not exactly that kind of student It's not body. true. He met with these low-income schools. Well, it's I think true. one thing is for sure, charter schools are here to stay. Indeed. Oh, I think oh, we know yeah. that. All right, and we'll leave it at that. Do we agree? Continue. Yeah, there we go. Thanks for <laughs> Thank joining you, us. We Jeff. appreciate it. Thanks very much. Tonight's edition of Arizona Artbeat looks at the first ever Southwest Vocal Competition. It's an effort for singers to win a chance to perform with the Phoenix Opera Orchestra at the Orpheum Theater in Phoenix. The competition is also a vocal health education effort on the part of the Mayo Clinic's voice department. Joining us now are Gail Massaro, co-founder and creative director of the Phoenix Opera, and Dr. David Lott from the Mayo Voice Department. Good to have you both here. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. Thank you. All right, Gail, uh, the Southwest Vocal Competition, what are we talking about here? Oh, well, I am thrilled to be here, but I'm excited and I'm exhilarated and I'm exhausted because we had first rounds one and two this past weekend at Mayo in their Taylor Auditorium and we had singers from virtually every corner of the state competing. Nothing like this has ever existed in our state. And um, the purpose is to discover and feature and foster and nurture the talent that we have here, which is extraordinary. It will culminate in a finals concert February 8th at the Orpheum Theater with the Phoenix Opera Orchestra and three international judges are coming in you know, it's a little bit like an American Idol situation. Each singer will sing two arias with the orchestra, 70-piece orchestra on stage. And, uh, and like American Idol, but it won't take a year to find out who's going to be the winner, everything will be done that night. And the judges are a New York agent, someone who runs one of the best opera companies in, in the country, the Milwaukee uh, Florentine Opera, and an international superstar from the Deutsche Oper Berlin. This is a life-changing, career-launching opportunity for one of our very own right here from Arizona. All right. Got the competition down. Now I've got more questions for you, okay. though. Uh, but where does vocal health come into all this? Absolutely. Well, as a physician, the important part for us is not just treating problems when they arise, but actually prevention. And that's a big part of Mayo's uh, program in general. It's not only take care of patients, but also the preventive medicine, the education, and really vocal health in general. And you know, as, as a broadcaster, you understand the vital role that your voice has, not only in your personal life, but as your career. And if you're setting your career as a professional singer or a broadcaster or preacher, whatever it is, when your voice goes, your livelihood goes, and that's a big problem. So are, would, would you suggest that people that are into opera, classical music, maybe, and, and any form of music, broadcast, just aren't aware of some of these preventative measures? Absolutely, yep, and that's the big reason why we wanted to partner with the Phoenix Opera, is to try to get that word out that not only can we help you if you have a problem, but it's so much more important to prevent these problems before they begin. So everything from, from not doing this to taking that and 
it's these sorts of things. Correctly, exactly. So as part of the, the competition from this weekend, we actually had different education sessions throughout the day at different breaks. And some of that were some of the myth busters, you know, do I drink honey when I have yes. a sore throat? Or some of the things that uh, we tell ourselves that may or may not be really true that actually can't harm you. And this is also really important. Of course, you know my passion is for singing and for, and for the voice. But this is also very important for teachers, for TV personalities, anyone who uses their, their voice. Um, all kinds of things can happen. Should you speak? Should you sing when you're sick? How to handle it if you do? Those topics were covered, and that's the educational outreach aspect of this. As far as the competition, back to that for a second here. Who, who are there age limits? Who competes? How do they even get into the competition? Okay, this is Arizona's talent. So you have to be in Arizona, ages 21 to 35, because voice has to be of a certain maturity level in order to really sing opera and do opera justice uh, and have the wherewithal to really be a professional singer. And that's what we're looking for, is talent that we can launch and that we can feature. You know Phoenix Opera has always been devoted to not only bringing international artists here to Phoenix, um, but also to nurturing and developing the extraordinary talent that we have right here in our state. So you needed five arias. You got to pick. And as a former, you know, as a singer and opera singer myself, I remember those days of competitions. Oh, how many different languages and this and that, all those requirements. We wanted people to do what was in their best interest. Show me your best stuff. Strut it. And, and so they were allowed to pick their five arias. They had to live in Arizona. The age requirements and let's hear what you got. And obviously these are accomplished singers. These, did you just <laughs> pick someone up off the, the light no, rail stop it was here? The, the talent, I've always been a strong proponent for the, the talent that we have in the state, but I will tell you, it was spectacular. Amazing. It superseded all of our expectations and I want everyone to come to hear this competition. It's not an opera, it's a competition. It will, there will be opera arias, but the point is every one of the 10 finalists is the home team. Come and root for those singers, make them your own. And again, these are accomplished singers. These people know what they're doing. They've given their life now, the attention to this particular craft and art and hopefully for the winners and they'll go forward. Were you surprised that some didn't know certain things about their voice? No, unfortunately. And that was a big reason why we came to the Phoenix Opera and, and reached out to them to begin with, was we wanted this partnership because most performers, most people that use their voice professionally don't understand their instrument. And actually another one of the lectures that one of our other voice therapists gave was knowing your instrument. If you think about a, someone that plays the clarinet, they can take the clarinet apart, they know all the pieces, they can clean it, they understand how it comes together, but nobody could tell me the parts of the voice box. And that's your instrument, right? And so understanding how the anatomy interplays with the function of the voice box and then how you can best prepare that to do what it is you need it to do is, is, is kind of a blur for a lot of people. Common misperceptions, what's out there? Oh, geez, um, there's quite a few of them. So uh, the concept that you can drink something to make your vocal folds feel better, well, functionally, that doesn't make any sense because their job is to close to protect your airway so food doesn't go down or water doesn't go down into your airway. So if you have something that touches your vocal folds, that's when we say, oh, you know, something went down the wrong pipe and you cough violently. Right. That's the only way anything ever touches your vocal cords or your vocal <laughs> folds is if it goes down the wrong way. So that's probably the biggest misconception. But also hydration is so important, especially here in Arizona. But I learned something that it takes about an hour. You drink something an hour before you really need to be hydrated in order to sing well. You can steam your throat and inhale the steam right down into your throat. I thought that was a little myth that my mother used mm -hmm. to tell me, but it's not. It really is true, and that's very important as well. And, you know, we did, I don't know, did you bring your scope along? We thought you might like to have yourself scoped on camera. Yeah, so we'll we can see what your vocal cords look like. We'll take care of that That's the, the show. Yeah, yeah. I can't yeah. wait for that. I want to uh, keep you healthy. Yeah. Uh, the competition is when now for the finals? February 8th at the Orpheum Theater. Sunday night at 7 o'clock. Tickets are available online at phoenixopera.org. That is the easiest way to get tickets. Student rush is $10. Um, high school student seats are being underwritten, and they can come for free. Uh, we have contacted all the high school teachers in the state. General public tickets are, start at just $20. And as far as knowing your voice, knowing your instrument, what, what information do you think all of us, whether we're broadcasters or singers or just, you know, out there living our lives and want to have a healthy, what do we need to know? First thing is listen to your body. You'll know if your voice is starting to change, 
if it starts to hurt when you speak or if it fatigues as time goes on, that's the sign that something within that function has gone awry. It shouldn't hurt to speak. It shouldn't hurt for people to hear you speak. And if those types of things are starting to happen, then take a step back and get in early before a problem arises. All right. Well, great information there. Good luck on the Thank contest. You. Come, come join us. All right. We'll see who wins. Uh-huh. The voice <laughs> of Arizona. That sounds That's good. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, we will hear from minority legislative leadership and get their take on the session so far. And we will look at how the Super Bowl puts a spotlight on domestic violence and human trafficking. That is at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Helios Education Foundation is proud to underwrite Arizona Education, a 12-month series highlighting the issues affecting college and career readiness of our students. Through a decade of strategic partnerships, Helios is working to change lives and strengthen communities through education.